On March 28, 1834, a storm arrived. The United States Senate took action they had never done before and which they have never done since. Political war was a torrential downpour in Washington between members of the Democratic Party and the Whig Party when the Senate decided that taking 10 weeks to deliberate what ended as one single paragraph was the right course of action. It was just too important to ignore. These lawmakers wanted to send a message to the President of the United States, or Caesar, as some were calling him. He had gone too far. This business on the table, this thing too important to ignore, this thing that required 10 weeks of the Senate's attention was a non-binding censure, a formal scolding, just words. But they drafted and debated, drafted and debated, and finally, by a vote of 26 to 20, it passed, reading in part, resolved that the president has assumed upon himself authority and power not conferred by the constitution and laws, but in derogation of both. Only 34 words in total, but the message was clear. President Andrew Jackson, in their eyes, was wholly unworthy of the power he wielded and was comporting himself so recklessly as to threaten the Constitution itself. And of course, we can talk about the mutual political disgust and vitriol between Jackson and his enemies. After all, it was his arch nemesis Henry Clay who authored the censure. But to leave it there would be disingenuous. Andrew Jackson, a man who said of himself, I know what I am fit for, I am not fit to be president, or as a woman who knew him from North Carolina put it, well, if Andrew Jackson can be president, anybody can, was pushing the bounds of the Constitution as it had been intended. And in doing so, he changed the way all memorable or modern presidents since have used executive power. So what exactly did he do? In the case of the 1834 censure, he failed to procure a document for Congress, but this was merely a pretext to attack him on all the other things he had done in his term and a half in office. Here's one of those things. After Congress's initial approval, President Jackson rejected their Maysville Road project in 1830. Now, this isn't an exact outline of the original road. This is what eventually became US Route 68. But Jackson vetoed something very similar that would have used federal funds to connect Lexington, Kentucky to Maysville. Now, you and I might debate the merits of an infrastructure project, but Jackson's opponents did not see it that way. For them, the president's veto was nothing short of a constitutional crisis. Henry Clay wrote, We're all shocked and mortified by the rejection of the Maysville Road. We shall be contending a principle which wears a monarchical aspect. Former President John Quincy Adams said, The overseer ascendancy is complete. And if you're wondering how a road veto can lead to the monarchical upheaval of liberty, we're going to have to go a little bit deeper with this topic and examine how the founders saw the presidency, what powers they compromised when designing the chief executive of the United States. Now, Spoiler alert, the founders didn't agree on everything. The Constitution wasn't handed down from Mount Sinai, but rather written through a series of debates which took place over four months in a courthouse in Philadelphia. Which is why we need to look here at some of James Madison's notes that he took about what the founders were arguing during the constitutional debates. It's public domain, I just happen to have a copy in a compilation book. Now, one delegate in particular raised some eyebrows during the debate on June 18th, 1787. His proposal, a supreme executive authority, one who served for life. No good executive could be established on a Republican model, he argued. Only the English model was good on this subject. If it sounds to you like supreme executive authority for life is simply a euphemism for king, you're on the right track to understanding why basically no one voted for this plan. The 55 delegates at this moment probably sat back in their chairs and asked, didn't we just fight a war to get rid of the king? But American fear of monarchy goes deeper than just memories of George III. A constitutional republic was still a pretty radical experiment. The Articles of Confederation, which had been the first attempt at American government starting in 1781, didn't even have a chief executive. That was the level of skepticism of executives, and specifically national executives. Under the Articles, power was skewed in favor of the legislature, and more so, the individual 13 states. And then here was this guy, a mere three years after independence from England's monarch, giving a presentation worthy of Broadway, proposing the president stays in office until he dies? This man was, of course, Alexander Hamilton. Though respected, he went on to be George Washington's secretary of the treasury, this Anglophile was clearly in the minority. But he wasn't alone. The second president, John Adams, got himself into trouble when he proposed referring to George Washington as his majesty the president, or even worse, his high mightiness the president of the United States and protector of their liberties. This fetishization of monarchy might strike some as 18th century Stockholm syndrome, but luckily the president drafted at the Constitutional Convention wasn't infected. 
ultimately the powers of the president were pretty narrow. I mean, the founders could barely agree on having one executive and not like a panel of three executives. So here's ultimately what the president could do. Enforce laws passed by Congress. Command armed forces, but not declare war. That power lies with Congress. Propose budgets, but Congress can ultimately pass or reject those budgets. Negotiate treaties, which then need approval from the Senate. Appoint judges and ambassadors, again with Senate consent. The common strain here is the Congress, which seems to have an authority or a check on just about everything the president can do. Indeed, the founders wanted the focus to be on the Congress, specifically the directly elected House of Representatives, not the indirectly elected electoral college selected president. Even the president's veto power was envisioned in a limited way. The first six presidents only vetoed a total of 10 pieces of legislation, and that rejection was based on constitutionality not personal preference like we see in our era. And even this wasn't enough for some people. This highly restricted president, basically the administrator of the will of Congress, we pass the laws and we check everything that you do, this arrangement wasn't good enough for some people. After the Constitution was drafted and signed, it went to the 13 states for approval. And there, it met criticism from a loose group called the Anti-Federalists, who opposed the Constitution for a variety of reasons, among them, the idea the president would evolve into an autocrat. The most well-known criticism of executive power of the president can be found in Cato 5, published in the New York Journal on November 22, 1787. And even though this side of the debate ultimately lost, their warnings echo through time. Again, reading from Cato number 5. Great powers of the president would lead to oppression and ruin. This frame of government differs, but very immaterially, from the establishment of monarchy in Great Britain. You are about to precipitate yourselves into a sea of uncertainty and adopt a system so vague. Is it because you do not believe that an American can be a tyrant? A king ignores rules. A king imposes his will. A king can haunt you even once he's gone. A democratically elected king is the worst king of all. But the only king in power on Inauguration Day 1829 was, as Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story called it, King Mob. The night after Andrew Jackson was sworn in as the seventh president, his critics were more preoccupied by the absolute chaos in the White House than his authoritarian tendencies. You see, in the public eye, Andrew Jackson was impervious to criticism. He was able to get away with things that would have sunk any other politician of the time. Even though he had married Rachel Donaldson when she was still married to another man, even though he had started open shootouts on crowded streets more than once, killed a man in cold blood in 1806, slaughtered natives on multiple occasions, even though he had seemingly usurped President Monroe during the first Seminole War in 1818, invading Spanish Florida and extrajudicially executing British officers, Jackson was an American war hero. Voters loved him. During the War of 1812 with the British, he led a group of outnumbered men to one of the few American victories. In a slew of embarrassing losses and destruction, including the burning of Washington, D.C., Jackson's repelling of the British in New Orleans gave politicians and citizens something, someone, to celebrate. The hero of the common man, Andrew Jackson. When Jackson ran for president, he thought himself a man standing for the men of America against the political elites. For too long, he thought, the president had simply been chosen by a small enclave of intelligentsia in Washington, where all institutions corrupted into the swamp on which they were built. Like Thomas Jefferson, Jackson believed that the uniqueness of America lay in small farms, individual men expanding west and tilling the fertile country into prosperity. But below this call for individual freedom lay a number of deep ironies one of which John Meacham describes very well in his Jackson biography, American Lion. He writes, Jackson took the Jeffersonian vision of the centrality of the people further, and he took Jefferson's view of the role of the president further still. To Jackson, the idea of the sovereignty of the many was compatible with a powerful executive. He saw that liberty required security, that freedom required order, that the well-being of the parts of the union required that the whole remain intact. If he felt a temporary resort to autocracy was necessary to preserve democracy, Jackson would not hesitate. In other words, sometimes you need a tyrant to protect the will of the people, and Jackson would play this role several times during his administration. 
and it was this behavior that concerned critics long before Jackson ever stepped into the White House. For example, while rescuing New Orleans under martial law, Jackson arrested federal district judge Dominique Hall, who had insisted he fulfill a writ of habeas corpus. A general arresting a member of the judiciary would have major consequences for American history in the long term, but in the short term, it simply added to the ammunition that Jackson's opponents were stockpiling should he ever run for office. He was an ill-tempered philanderer, murderous, a potential tyrant, or as Henry Clay put it, perhaps speaking for all nervous elites in Washington, D.C., I cannot believe that the killing of 2,000 Englishmen at New Orleans qualifies a person for the various difficult and complicated duties of the presidency, an existential threat to the Union. But it didn't matter. Election of 1828. With 56% of the vote, General Jackson was elected president. It was the mass of newly enfranchised voters, non-land-owning white men. Jackson spoke directly to them. Perhaps he represented the man they wished to be, wealthy. He had a large slave plantation in Franklin, Tennessee, heroic. He was willing to fight and die for the things he believed. A bit of a temper like them, he relished conflict. They celebrated his victory with the largest inaugural crowd to date. The Democratic Party and the Jacksonian era were born. These were the men and women who flooded the White House on inauguration night, filling into capacity, shattering glasses, begging for federal jobs, drinking themselves silly, enjoying the idea of the great general in office, the common man in the house of their father. And yes, as strange as it sounds, there was a fatherly connection here. You might call it a cult of personality today. One newspaper described Jackson's interaction with the crowd on a trip he took from Baltimore to Boston. He appeared to feel as a father surrounded by a numerous band of children, happy in their affections and loving them with all a parent's love. Anyway, the inaugural party got so crazy that Jackson had to slip out a window. Had he known how crazy the next eight years would be, he might have stayed and gotten straight to work. The drama of the Jackson administration crescendoed as time went on. What started as concerns about the motley supporters wrecking the White House and sycophantic political appointments ended with Jackson deploying federal troops against fellow Americans. So like his administration, let's start with the least controversial and go to the most. Now, the least controversial, my opinion, the Maysville Road veto. Remember, we talked about this earlier. Jackson vetoed the infrastructure project not because he thought it was unconstitutional, but because he was focused on bringing down the national debt and because the project seemed to focus exclusively on Kentucky. It probably also didn't help that his rival Henry Clay represented the state. When the veto came, critics freaked out. Prior presidents had vetoed a total of six bills between them. Jackson started with Maysville and went on to veto 11 more bills, four of them all within a week. Napoleon's takeover of the French Republic at the turn of the century was still fresh on Congress's mind. Seeing a former general acting in such an unprecedented way, challenging the understanding that Congress was the most direct line of the people, definitely stirred the Washington pot. The way we understand the president's veto power today comes directly from Andrew Jackson. What we see as the president exerting influence and being up on a soapbox was seen as tyrannical to his contemporaries. A king ignores rules. Let's step forward a little bit in time to 1833. The president is drowning in crisis. We're in the White House and Jackson is on a monstrous 15 minute rhetorical tirade directed at a delegation from New York. Witnesses said his gesticulation was so wild that he at one point had to set down his pipe. They had come to the White House seeking economic relief, but Jackson was more interested in berating them for even showing up. We have no money here, gentlemen, he said. Biddle has all the money. You see, the New Yorkers had hit the nerve most sensitive to the Tennessean president at the time, the National Bank. Jackson hated the National Bank, hated the man running the bank, and he had just risked his political career to kill it. The bank is trying to kill me, but I shall kill it. The delegates' reactions perhaps reflect how many of the president's true enemies rose and fell. Jackson was cordial first, ruthless second. In the same way he had politely invited the men into the White House, he had been pretty genial to Biddle during their first meeting before launching an all-out assault. But wait, who is Biddle and why does he have all the money? Again, reading from American Lion. Jackson worried about the power of the Second National Bank of the United States, an institution that held the public's money but was not subject to the public's control or to the president's. Presided over by Nicholas Biddle, brilliant, arrogant, and as willful in his way as Andrew Jackson was in his, the bank was a rival interest that, Jackson believed, made loans to influence elections, paid retainers to pro-bank lawmakers, and could control much of the nation's economy on a whim. 
The only thing that Andrew Jackson hated more than elected political elites was unelected political elites. And Nicholas Biddle was the epitomization of that characterization. And so Jackson had made it his personal goal to bring down Biddle and his bank and send all the money to state and private banks, which Jackson hated just a little bit less. But Biddle was ready to fight back as he knew the clock was ticking. Allying himself with Jackson's enemies in the Senate, a bank recharter was pushed through the Congress and onto the president's desk a mere four months before the 1832 presidential election. Biddle's gamble was clear. Option one, Jackson signs the recharter and the bank gets what it wants. Two, Jackson vetoes the recharter and the general popularity of the bank leads to his punishment on election day. New bank supporting president, bank gets what it wants. Option three, Jackson refuses to sign the bill or tepidly vetoes, he appears weak and afraid of the institution and his enemies. Loses re-election, bank gets what it wants. Seems like a pretty dire situation for Andrew Jackson. But there was a fourth option. The Congress, the executive, and the court must each for itself be guided by its own opinion of the Constitution, Jackson explained in his veto of the bank recharter. The opinion of the judges has no more authority over Congress than the opinion of Congress has over judges. And on that point, the president is independent of both. A couple things are happening here. Number one, Jackson is calling Biddle's bluff. You want a re-election battle? Let's do it. My children are the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, laborers. You represent the elites of artificial distinction, gratuities, and exclusive privileges. Second, not only is the opinion of Congress irrelevant, but don't preach to me about the Supreme Court. I'm autonomous of both the court and the Congress. Jackson had expanded his power again. He had declared his willingness to ignore the other branches of the government. Not even a year later, Jackson would declare a ruling of the Supreme Court stillborn. That is to say, like a miscarriage, decisions of the court are born dead into the world, from a mother to whom the father does not yield. With this veto of the bank, Jackson had cemented the political paradigm in the way he saw fit, and he was rewarded easily winning his re-election with 54% of the vote. The bank was left to bleed out the final years of its charter. King Jackson, as his opponents now called him, had won. When the delegation from New York arrived a year later seeking economic relief from Andrew Jackson, it was because Biddle and the bank were using the only tactic they had left, creating an artificial credit crisis and strangling the national economy. But the battle was already lost. The funds were removed and the institution was liquidated in 1841. A king imposes his will. And this fight basically raged and concluded between 1832 and 1833, arguably the most consequential period in Jackson's presidency. That's because during this struggle with the bank, Jackson had sent ominous orders to the Secretary of War on a different matter, secretly replaced the federal soldiers and officers in Charleston, South Carolina, with soldiers and officers loyal to him and the Union. Therefore, let the officers and men be relieved by a faithful detachment. Let it be done without a hint of the cause until it is effected. The president was secretly preparing for war with one of the states in the Union. Now, the South Carolinians didn't expect it to be this way. Jackson believed himself to have been born in South Carolina. He was a child of the South, a slave owner with a massive cotton plantation in Tennessee. Why wouldn't he be empathetic to their complaints? Namely, that the tariff passed under the previous president in 1828 was an abomination. The tax was hurting cotton exports to Britain, and that was hurting the Southern economy, hurting Jackson's bottom line too. And that's why Jackson's own vice president, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, pushed within the administration to allow Southern nullification. In other words, allow individual states to discern whether federal laws were constitutional or not, and reject them if not. The implications of nullification were huge. How can the slope not be slippery if state after state can simply reject laws they don't approve of? On the other hand, it is a classical American question. How can we be sure that the federal government won't exploit and oppress the smaller states that make up the whole? Jackson himself was a bit foggy on the issue. If southern states couldn't nullify a tax law, could they nullify a northern attempt to end slavery? Jackson was still foggy as of 1830, when the Washington establishment gathered at the Indian Queen Hotel to celebrate the birthday of the late Thomas Jefferson. After dinner, toasts were raised. President Jackson, in prepared words, called out, Our federal union, it must be preserved. Jackson was making it clear to the nullifiers in the room his own vice president included, 
that he was the patriarch of the nation and that he chose to side with the Union. Vice President Calhoun took his turn. Our federal union, next to our liberties, most dear. Newspapers wrote of the drama the next day. Game on. Jackson was in a difficult spot for the next three years. Go too hard on the South Carolinians and their nullification, and the other southern states might join them. Acquiesce, and good luck trying to impose tax laws in the future. Now with everything we know about Andrew Jackson, we would expect that he would escalate the situation. With his temper, scream, shoot someone, grab more power, and crush this group. At this critical moment in our history, Andrew Jackson's tactics were directly tied to the continued existence of the Union. And Congress was busy trying to calm tensions as well. In July 1832, they passed and the president signed a reduction in the tariff. But for Southern nullifiers, it wasn't enough. In late November 1832, the South Carolina Convention declared the tariff utterly null and void proclaiming, we will consider the passage by Congress of any act authorizing the employment of a military or naval force against the state of South Carolina, hereby null and void. They add, at every hazard, all South Carolinians, civil or military, will obey and execute the ordinance. Not a month later in December, the Secretary of War reported back that 5,000 stands of arms and 1,000 rifles were on their way to Charleston, while the President ranted privately that he had 300,000 volunteers ready to march to South Carolina. The Civil War was about to kick off 30 years ahead of schedule. On the 10th of December, in approximately 9,000 words, Jackson addressed the people of South Carolina. He wrote, Dictates of a high duty oblige me to solemnly announce to you that you cannot succeed. The laws of the United States must be executed. Disunion by armed force is treason. Are you ready to incur its guilt? Now, this sounds fiery, but Jackson actually struck a conciliatory tone throughout his message. The former mayor of New York commented, The language of the president is that of a father addressing his wayward children. Jackson worked with the Congress in 1833 to accomplish two things. First, lower the tariff again. Second, authorize his use of force if it be deemed necessary to execute the law. Now, was this another power grab by Andrew Jackson? The president sending in troops against a state is pretty radical. Nonetheless, the answer is not totally clear. Uh, number one, because Jackson didn't initiate the conflict. If it was a power grab, it wasn't a planned power grab. Number two, he asked the Congress for the use of force. Can I use force? Now, if they had said no, maybe he would have done it anyway, but we can't know the answer to that question. And then number three, it's not totally unprecedented. So in 1794, President Washington enforced a whiskey tax in Western Pennsylvania by means of the military. But with Jackson, it would be the first time the president sent troops against an entire state. Congress gave Jackson both things he wanted. They lowered the tariff and they authorized his use of force to collect it. The efforts paid off and the South Carolinians backed down. But one man was watching Jackson's activities very carefully. He saw General Jackson's measures to suspend habeas corpus and arrest a judge in New Orleans. He looked back at President Washington's use of force and President Jackson's threatened use of force to preserve the laws of the Union. This 20-something from Illinois would make similar decisions in a generation. As John Meacham wrote describing Jackson's feelings, Sometimes you need a tyrant to preserve liberty. But tyranny to preserve liberty is... what? A paradox of history. And we could not finish that history without looking at what happened to some of Jackson's other children. Now, Jackson, like most Americans, wanted the land on which the Cherokees, Choctaws, Creeks, and Seminole tribes lived. In 1830, he got permission from Congress in the form of the Indian Removal Act to make deals with the tribes and relocate them west of the Mississippi River. Jackson's letter to the Creek tribe a year earlier sheds light on his overall approach to the issue and his pejorative way of referring to the natives as his family. I speak to you as your father and your friend. You know I love my white and red children. You and my white children are too near to each other to live in harmony and peace. Beyond the great river Mississippi, your father has provided a country large enough for all of you, and he advises you to remove to it. When the Supreme Court tried to intervene in his and the state of Georgia's planned expulsion of natives, he declared the ruling stillborn. As Jackson aged comfortably at the Hermitage, enjoying the wealth he produced with slaves, his successor, 
President Martin Van Buren executed the most violent removal of the natives who refused to sign treaties. As Jackson said in his farewell address, the members of that ill-fated race were now under the paternal care of the general government. The lights in the shining city on the hill then dimmed. The white children wanted the removal, but they didn't want to see it. And that's why a democratically elected tyranny is the worst tyranny of all. Here we have an account from Alexis de Tocqueville describing the expulsion of the Choctaw. It is impossible to describe the frightful sufferings that attend these forced migrations. Hunger is in the rear, war awaits them, and misery besets them on all sides. It was then the middle of winter, and the cold was unusually severe. The snow had frozen hard upon the ground, and the river was drifting huge masses of ice. The Indians had their families with them and they brought in their train the wounded and sick, with children newly born and old men upon the verge of death. I saw them embark to pass the mighty river, and never will that solemn spectacle fade from my remembrance. No cry, no sob was heard among the assembled crowd. All were silent. The calamities were of ancient date, and they knew them to be irremediable. A father can break rules. A father can impose his will. A father can haunt you, even once he's gone. In the writing of this video, John Meacham's American Lion was an absolutely indispensable source. Quotes from contemporaries, historical parallels, I've left a link for it in the description. And as always, there's a comment, a pinned comment below, with some other documentaries and more information about Andrew Jackson. Later, guys.